Happy Friday, everybody. Another long week in the land of privacy, data protection, ethics, tech policy, so much going on. And we are only going to talk about the privacy and data protection pieces. Obviously, there's competition, there's um, Section 230, there, well, we could talk about the AI regulation, which is both about privacy and not. But here's what I'm looking to talk about today. Thanks to you who have joined us. And if there's anything else you want to put on the agenda, uh, let me know and we will uh, we'll talk about it. I'm going to keep an eye on the comments. So I definitely want to talk about the rollout of iOS 14.5, um, how that is playing out, some of the outstanding questions and issues about this permission dialogue, um, some of the confusion I see. Uh, with developers um, who are trying to understand and figure out um, what happened if you didn't have legal counsel and you didn't sit with um, technical and engineering folks as you filled out the nutrition label, uh, you may be quite surprised at uh, some of um, the results. So we'll talk about that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the FTC dark patterns program that took place this week. Um, many of you may have seen it, a couple of the takeaways. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the definition of health and de-identified under CCPA. And also today was the EDPB uh, roundtable on research, which we participated in. It was a closed door thing where they had a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, people interested and tried to pick representative uh, stakeholders. Let's start with the Apple the Apple stuff. Let's start with the iOS 14.5 because that's probably the big, big news uh, since that is really changing advertising and um, privacy on your um, iOS devices in a very significant way. So to quickly recap, and let me give you the recap because I feel like if you don't have some of the background, um, you can make judgments here that, are, um, the, that don't have the full picture. Several years ago, um, I was tracking fairly closely. I'm, I'm deeply interested um, for many, many years on when and how and why consumers make opt-in or opt-out decisions. Um, you know, the triangle I, the industry icon that indicates that behavioral advertising is taking place, which you see in the corner of many, many, many ads, most ads today, although many people don't notice it, it's there. Um, it typically gets a very small opt-out rate. Now, people don't see it, or maybe they see it but don't understand what it is, or they don't click on it, um, or the opt-out doesn't work well. A lot of reasons. But typically, the rate is way under 1%. Um, 20 years ago, when I was Chief Privacy Officer at DoubleClick, um, I would keep an eye on the opt-out rate we had. We offered an opt-out cookie. Um, the only way you could find it honestly, was either in our privacy policy, and obviously consumers were not going to the double-click privacy policy. They didn't hear of us unless they were investors. This is long before Google bought double-click. Uh, or if um, if the publishers or advertisers that they visited referred to our opt-out or to the Network Advertising Initiative opt-out. Uh, so the rate, you know, so it wasn't easily accessible by any means, um, and the rate was always far less than 1%. Occasionally, there'd be a big media story, um, 60 Minutes uh, ran a piece that it would repeat every so often uh, that literally walked people through uh, opting out, and I would see a spike, um, uh, but typically it was very low. When iOS and Android started providing a way to initially clear um, or request limit ad tracking, again, you, you didn't see this anywhere. You had to go into settings. Um, but to my surprise, people used it. Um, cookie settings, right? Again, um, not obvious and, and visible. You have to go into settings or take a look when you set up your browser, if you download a new browser or an update, uh, and you have to use the settings. Um, people were using the options to block cookies in some significant numbers to the point that all the browsers, except for uh, Chrome, uh, you know, have long defaulted blocking third-party cookies. Now, let me be clear. Those were not perfect measures. Some of the blocking, for instance, even at Safari, which early on 
block third party cookies, blocked it only on set and not on read. Meaning that if you already had that cookie, it would be relayed when the company was in third party context. So by that, I mean, if I visit um, AOL or Google um, or Apple or any publisher, um, and then when I'm on another site, they are in background, they are in third party context, right? Which certainly some of those big companies are, the cookie would be read. A new one wouldn't be set in third party context, but it would be read. So they, and these things are starting to be fixed. So it was always a bit holy, but, but people were finding this. And obviously now Google has announced that it will follow uh, and join the other browsers. But on mobile devices, when Apple and Android created this option in the settings, I was really curious. Um, it wasn't easy to find. Um, it wasn't even under privacy. If you remember when Apple first created it, the limit ad tracking setting uh, wasn't even on the privacy. Um, they eventually moved it on the privacy, uh, which obviously made sense. Um, so several years ago, I would check in every so often with colleagues who I knew uh, who were in ad tech and say, what are you seeing? How many people are using the limit ad tracking? Because in the beginning, it didn't actually clear. It just sent a request. You could stay, take steps to reset it, um, uh, or you could take step, steps to clear it. But the main setting was limit ad tracking, which just sent a request to companies saying, hey, please don't do behavioral advertising, basically something like that. Um, but it was really just up to the terms of service that you, the developer signed with Apple to know whether anybody was following it. But surprisingly, 17 to 20% of all users were going in to their settings and using this. So far more than we're ever finding any of the industry uh, opt-outs. Now, maybe because they trusted that if you go in and you use the settings on your device and you play around, and even if it's a limited number of people, people do go in, they look at their settings uh, versus clicking on something, going to some third party site, dealing with some ad tech company you never heard of and all that. Um, so the rates were relatively high, 17 to 20%. Um, I confess, I, I didn't pay attention the last two years. And I was surprised just a couple of months ago when I started um, uh, you know, hearing about the Apple and um, uh, iOS changes. I said, well, what's the actual current opt-out rate? And surprisingly, the current uh, opt-out rate is um, as high as 40%, according to one expert who, you know, again, has direct um, uh, information, 40% um, of all users. So with that, uh, and of course, in recent years, the limit ad tracking, at least on iOS, was changed to clearing the identifier, not just requesting, but Apple, therefore, barring the availability, um, zeroing out that uh, IDFA so that the third parties uh, and apps didn't have it. Now, I want to make sure I set that information up because I think if you don't have it and you start looking at what Apple did, uh, you uh, can draw some very different conclusions. 100% of people were not being tracked. 40% were out. Now, some people have upgraded to iOS 14.5. It started rolling out. I got it on Saturday night. Uh, I'm in the beta program, so maybe I got it a little earlier. Um, but the general public started getting it on Monday. Um, and some people have gone in and they've said, it's not working for me. Uh, it's default off. The option that says allow apps to continue to uh, request to track me is off, so I'm not getting the protection. Wrong. You're getting the protection. Here's what Apple did. If you are one of the 40% who has already opted out, right? Why should you be back in? Why should every app be asking you again, do you want to be tracked? You already said in previous versions of the operating system that you don't want to be tracked. So the default that Apple has set for the 40% of users who previously said they don't want to be tracked, the master switch, they've set a master switch, right? So they've done a couple of things. 
One, they've created a master switch where users can say, don't even ask me. Don't want to hear from you. Don't trigger that ATT permission dialogue. I already said, I'm not interested. So that is grayed out. It's off. You can turn it back on, and then you'll start getting the app by app requests but you are automatically protected. And so 40% of the people are not getting this experience. Now, some of them are confused. They say, wait, apps are now supposed to be popping up and asking me permission. No, you've already said you're not interested. So those apps will not actually pop up and ask for permission. You're protected. It is off. For the 60% of you who um, didn't previously do it, once you've upgraded, you will now be asked by every app that wants access to the IDFA, the Identifier for Advertising, the only ID that Apple wants you to be able to use, you if you are a publisher or an advertiser or a third-party uh, company, um, that's the only identifier you're allowed to use for advertising or for analytics. If you use something else, you may be violating uh, Apple's terms, uh, in which case you can get, you know, booted out of the app store. So that's the way they ensure um, that uh, you don't track using alternate methodologies. Okay, so assuming you're a developer, advertiser or a publisher, and uh, you don't really care about the IDFA. Okay, you're not gonna ask for it. You didn't use it. Maybe you didn't bother with it. That's not all that has changed. IDFA is not the only thing that has changed. If you read the explanation of tracking that Apple has set out, tracking is also defined as not just using the IDFA to track across other websites, but if you have appended data, let's say you uh, use email, let's say your customers sign in they authenticate. You have a subscription relationship with them. Maybe you're a telco. You signed up for, I don't know, T-Mobile or at t Verizon, Sprint, Vodafone. Um, and now you've downloaded the app they make to manage your account. Maybe you have a Tesla. They have a fancy app. lets you do a lot of remote things, even see your car remotely and all that kind of stuff. There's an app. You may have to authenticate with email to get into that app. If there are ads in that app and you have appended data to your customer list, and almost every company has appended data to their customer list, right? Maybe is this a male or a female? Maybe where are these people? Maybe income levels, maybe, I don't know, I don't have a lot of information about my customers. I went to some data aggregator to say, who are my customers? Tell me about them. What kind of people are they? Give me information about their attributes. Do they own other cars other than Teslas, right? This is all known, right? You have a, uh, insurance, your car is registered. This information is known. And almost every company has added information to their customer list. If you have an ad or if you are doing analytics using the identifier people have entered, including their email, and you have appended third-party data, Apple requires that you request permission through that same pop-up. Now, a lot of developers did not realize this and their heads are exploding because their apps are being rejected, even though they don't ask for IDFA. Now, how does Apple know? Mazel tov, you told them. Congratulations, you told them. Where did you tell them? You filled out the Apple Nutrition label, which launched in advance of this. The new screens that Apple provides that developers have to fill out in the um, App Store. It's displayed to users. And it's portrayed as a better way to understand what data is collected. It's standardized but it actually has a category about data that is used to track you across sites or append and link data to you. And when you fill that information out, you are telling consumers that you are doing this. 
They're also telling Apple and the App Store review is that you are doing this. And when your app is reviewed and you have properly filled this out accurately, boom, you're being told you need to ask for the permission dialogue. Now, this is turning out to be a big shock to people who, like us, are not in the weeds, really reading and discussing and debating and analyzing this the way a lot of the FPF stakeholders have been. But that's how it works. And that's why a couple of mysteries for those who you know have been confused. Why is my why am I not getting the pop-up? Uh, why is my option grayed out? And it's because you previously already told Apple that you don't want to get these pop-ups. So Apple has respected that, and you don't even get the pop-ups. If you want to see what they're like and you want every app you have asking you, go ahead. Maybe you have that open and you're still not getting the requests. Well, some of the advice that apps are getting is don't bother people with this question as soon as you um, download the app. You might They might say, I don't want to bother downloading the app. Let them download the app. Let them use it. Then ask them. Now, Apple has said you cannot then say, uh, sorry, you better. You got to. No, it has to be fully optional. Apple has also provided design guidance about the screen that people might pop in advance, right? A lot of people, a lot of companies aren't going to rely only on the iOS dialog screen because it's limited space. Apple has written the dialog on the top of it where they talk about tracking. And then you have some lines where you can say, please, this will help me with personalization. But if you're trying to comply with GDPR or other regulatory efforts, that's not enough, right? You need to state much more detail, explain purposes, uh, or maybe you just want to talk to people a little bit more extensively and explain why they should let you have the data. So companies will be popping a screen of their own maybe before, maybe after the Apple dialogue that is generated by the operating system, again, which you can edit, but you're, you're locked into that format. Or they may ask you next time or two times down uh, instead of you know interrupting you at, at, the, uh, at the moment. Um, so a little bit of information um, about that and as well why some apps are being turned down. Carefully fill out that nutrition label. Not only should you, because you want to be accurate with consumers um, and with regulators, uh, you can be legally liable. You're making a public statement um, about what you're doing, but it also intersects with this permission dialogue. Um, for folks in the audience, feel free to comment uh, or add in a topic, and I'll try to address it during this sort of more AMA style chatter here. Um, let me talk about another issue that we are working on. Many of the new state laws, um, Virginia, um, the California Privacy Act, California, the CPRA, uh, Florida today is either going to pass or not. It's, I think, the last day of their session, and a bill has passed um, uh, each house and is in the process of being amended and sent back over to the other house. Uh, as always, the big issue is the private right of action. So we'll see whether that makes it or not. Um, but every one of these state laws and most of the proposed federal privacy laws in the US uh, seek to regulate health data. Now, remember, we already have comprehensive legislation for medical data, right? HIPAA, health data that has been generated because of your relationship with a doctor, health insurer, uh, and so forth. Um, but when you visit WebMD and you search for, do I have this fatal disease or this embarrassing disease, um, that's not covered by HIPAA. Um, when you use a Fitbit and it has your steps, that's not covered by HIPAA. Um, if you take a DNA test and you send it into uh, one of the consumer genetics companies, that's not covered by HIPAA. So there's a vast amount of data, and clearly some of it should be covered by a significant, more sensitive uh, data type protection. GDPR, we have obviously a much sweeping, broader definition, but we still have a lot of confusion over what is and what isn't health. Let me give you an example. Um, obviously, if I have a medical record, uh, there's a new um, rule kicking in where companies that have your health data are to be penalized if they don't give it to you when you 
ask in a way that lets you download it into an app of your choice, right? And we all know how hard it is to get our medical records. Uh, there's long been law saying that you're supposed to, but in practice, it's been very difficult too. And now there are anti-blocking penalties that really are going to incentivize uh, the companies um, that hold your medical records uh, to give them to you in a digital way and download it. Okay, so that's nice. That starts out as HIPAA covered data. You download it. Now it's a file on your computer or it's in an app. It's no longer covered by HIPAA. It's now consumer data, but it is your medical record. Should that be covered? Probably yes, right? But what about the fact that the supermarket you go to, um, you know, you probably have a loyalty card uh, and it um, it tracks so the you know retailer can know what you're buying and uh, you know make make some decisions. Oh, the people who buy beer also buy diapers, right? Put those near each other or promote them together or you know, all the different interesting things, right? Oh, we did a big promotion with coupons. Did it actually lead to people buying the product? Uh, we started spending a lot of money on TV. We took ads in newspapers. Can we show that it, um, you know, led to it? So, right, there's a lot of reasons and we all participate in loyalty cards. Um, that's a pretty detailed health uh, record, isn't it? I mean, do you buy a lot of ice cream? Do you drink a lot of beer? Do you have high fat foods? What do you eat? How often do you buy that stuff? That's pretty sensitive, but is that a medical, should that be treated like health? I mean, it's your supermarket shopping, um, uh, your Apple watch, your Fitbit. Um, my, I have a why smart scale tells me whether I'm fatter or skinnier today than yesterday. And, you know, tracks, tracks that information over time. When does, oh, I, I look something up, you know, on the web, I search for something. Um, when does that become health and medical data? Uh, I go into a pharmacy. I know that when I buy stuff at the back of the store, right, from the pharmacy, that's likely to be covered by um, HIPAA, pharmacy uh, information, medical prescriptions. Um, but I could buy Tylenol at the front of the store. I could buy skin cream. Um, when does something become medical? When is it wellness? When is it fitness? If we include everything, because guess what? I can learn something health-related about almost anything. Hey, your race tells us a lot about your health, right? I mean, we know that, for instance, um, black women die in childbirth at a tragically high rate, and um, we're all trying to understand why. Is it stress? Is it bad health care? Is it being treated poorly at the hospital? Um, is it income? Um, but simply knowing your race, I know you're at higher risk for certain diseases. You know, I'm Jewish. There, taste tax is a is a is a concern. Um, 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 uh, Ashkenazic Eastern European, uh, you know, women have a higher risk for breast cancer. Um, so my weight, my race, my uh, where I live, sex where do you, well, now we have a, a line. HIPAA drew a very specific line and we knew what was in and what was out. Um, well, now we have in California health. If it's health, uh, you get some additional protections and rights. Um, it's opt out in California. Um, in Virginia, it's opt in. So what sort of health data do I need to opt in? So defining health is going to be critical. And we are working on a project to do just that. So stay tuned. Can't tell you more about it. If you're interested, ping, uh, comment, and so forth. Um, but I think we want to try to reasonably identify the kind of things that we all agree ought to be in. Um, maybe can we agree that there's some things that we all agree are not in? Um, and then what are some of the hard questions? Okay. Last topic. The FTC this week held a uh, hearing on dark patterns. I try not to say dark patterns. It just feels like maybe that's like a negative thing about things being dark or black or darker. Like why, why do we have to use that term? Maybe manipulative design is a little bit um, uh, better a term. So let's talk about manipulative design, right? That encourages people to, to do things online to their detriment um, that they maybe shouldn't have done, wouldn't have done. And 
lot of concerns as advocates and critics have pointed out all the different things from uh, tricks to get you to opt into cookie consents to signing up for things. Um, and legislators have responded. And again, in the state legislation, um, in this FTC program, in the European context, all over the world, we're making it clear that we don't want, we don't like dark patterns. So my question as somebody who's had to police dark patterns from the days when I was consumer affairs commissioner in New York many years ago, um, one of the biggest issues that drove me crazy was the fact that retailers, and this happens around the world, but if you open up your local newspaper, I think this is mostly a print uh, problem. I wonder if it's the case uh, in digital. I haven't noticed it as much. If you open up your local newspaper, uh, you'll notice big ads saying that um, your favorite retailer has a 50% off sale, a 30% off sale. Um, and if you look really closely, it often says in small text from an offering price. Hmm, what does that mean? And then if you look at the disclosure at the bottom of the page, the discounts listed here are from offering prices and may not have resulted in actual sales. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, most people don't. What does that mean? Well, you know what that means? We made up a big price so we could claim it's 50% off. Now, when companies started doing that, us consumer regulators at the time said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If it didn't sell, they're like, it's an offering price. So yeah, when did you offer it at that price? One day, one minute, no. So we had rules that said that if you claim a discount from an offering price, it actually has to be the price that you offered it for sale at. So we would keep track and we'd buy the newspaper and we had a staff person who'd go through it every day to count up whether you were actually offering it at full price for a certain number of days so that it was then legitimate for you to claim 50% off, 30% off, which would then encourage people to think that they're getting a deal. Or if something was offered as two for one, right? Was it actually that full price just for one, right? So we were enforcing against you know, manipulative designs, like disclosures and tricks that were used um, that could fool people. So the question now is, now that we're doing this online and we have all the issues of it being personalized for you and, you know, big data, when is this just the kind of stuff that's already illegal? The FTC already has deception and unfairness authority. Uh, there's years and years of consumer protection law and consumer protection regulation. Is this just regulators do your job? There's a lot of deceptive and unfair stuff happening. You have the authority, enforce it. Or are we arguing for something more? The Consumer uh, Finance Board, the CFPB, Consumer Finance Protection Board, uh, which was carved out you know, to particularly provide greater protection for financial related stuff, they have the authority to deal with deceptive, unfair, or abusive practices. Now, what is that exactly? There were some great presentations at the FTC panel that really demonstrated a lot of what people are calling dark patterns. But what I still think we don't have is sort of a breakdown where we say, these designs are already deceptive. And then here's another bucket of things that companies might do to persuade you to buy from them versus someone else. And they might use cognitive bias, a term that's mentioned. But when is cognitive bias legitimate, protected advertising communication type speech? We have all seen the ads with the, you know, beautiful, handsome models, the marble man selling me cigarettes, the sports car with, you know, the sexy people, uh, you know, posing in front of it, scantily clad, this and that, right? Sex, power, uh, glamour, celebrities, right? They all lean on a cognitive bias. Does that automatically become deceptive, right? Probably not. But when is it that I've got some knowledge that really gives me a disadvantage that we are saying that this is too persuasive in a way that isn't appropriate. Now we know that in the European data protection context, 
we have some very clear guidance that when it comes to providing personal information, it has to be as easy to say no as yes. We're seeing that around the cookie banners and elsewhere, because certainly the human rights framing says, no, you don't persuade someone to do something that has a human rights impact. You know, in the US or other contexts, you know, think about it as um, uh, surgery or, or donating an organ. Um, the ethics review that goes into that sort of consent. No, I shouldn't be selling you. I should be saying, here's the deal. Um, here's the, the, the benefits, here's the risks. You got to make a honest decision. Um, and so you see some application of that, but is that really what we're saying is applicable when it comes to, you know, Hey, please sign up for this product, right? That's probably in the U S context, at least, a room for some margin of legitimate advertising, legitimate persuasion. So to conclude, where is it that we really believe the FTC and other enforcers just need the tools? It's already against the law. Let's go for it. Where is it that we're saying, you know what, there's some new tricks here that might be beyond the law, things that might be abusive, things where we can prove that people really, Leo Strelovitz points out, regret their decision when you give them the full pieces of information and they really didn't mean to or wouldn't have made that decision, but yet maybe it's not really deceptive or unfair, but we where we can show empirically that um, it ought to be protected. And then where is it that there is um, maybe new rights that we wanna create? So some people have said, hey, it's a dark pattern. The New York Times, which has had a big profile to kind of talk about better privacy when it comes to advertising, um, but you can't cancel the New York Times online. You can sign up online. You can give them your money and pay with a credit card online. But you want to cancel, you got to call up. Uh, isn't that a dark pattern? Now, I don't know that that's a dark pattern. Um, we might say there should be a consumer right that if you sign up for something that lets you be billed, it ought to be as easy to say no. It's not the law today. I don't know that it's a dark pattern. Maybe I ought to make it very clear when you sign up, hey, it's gonna be a bit of more of a pain in the neck to cancel. We're gonna put a hurdle in front of you uh, and we wanna change that and give you a new consumer right. I'm for that, but it may not be a dark pattern, which is something that is tricking. But anyway, but some people are calling it a dark pattern, so maybe I'm wrong, but we have to have that discussion because I think that um, if we just call everything a dark pattern, um, we're not giving the regulators or the legislators a clear line. Um, another big tech company, it turns out that to cancel, you have to literally go through multiple screens. Now it's clear each time. It's not like they're tricking you, but like it's okay, how about this? Or how about that? Like there's more effort, dark pattern, or again, not okay to make it harder to get out than to uh, get in, right? Good. There are many other ways we might wanna address consumer rights it may or may not be manipulative design. And again, some people want to capture it and maybe this is a good opportunity to capture it on the manipulative design, but we need to really do the analysis and categorize it so that regulators can say, yeah, I'm protecting all these rights, just this right. Anyway, so we're looking at kicking off some work there as well, because I do think companies want guidance and regulators want guidance uh, around this. Um, thanks everybody. Glad to have a chance to chat and just share some of the things on my mind to end the long privacy week with you. We'll talk to you again next week. Oh, a couple of quick things that um, the team wanted me to remind you. If you're reading along with us, remember May 13th, you can sign up at our website. Um, Jackson in the background here has flipped up the cover of Privacy at the Margins by Scott Skinner Thompson, professor. Important book about uh, how privacy actually is a priority uh, when you think about it for marginalized groups. Um, so please do join us so that you can uh, chat and read with us. Um, uh, the uh, European Union, European Commission, sorry, has uh, moved forward with its broad AI regulatory effort. If you're feeling a little bit nervous because you don't understand machine learning and the current ways that you could do governance, uh, our team has an AI training. It's a bit more technical, but it's designed for lawyers and policy people. You can sign up at our uh, site. Um, it's the top um, top banner. Um, Mather, uh, that one is coming up soon. Um, you also can learn about our de-identification training. Um, what exactly is needed 
to de-identify data. Again, assuming you're not a statistician, so our team walks through that and people have found it to be uh, incredibly valuable and, um, and research. All right, my friends, have a good weekend. Happy Friday.